be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and psalms. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ, our God, by your precious cross, you have given us perfect salvation and made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming, Blessed are you, O wood of the holy cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlightened the apostles in their preaching, crowned the martyrs for their faith, and honored the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on that great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death, and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. 
Brothers and sisters, if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are the most pitiable people of all. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also came through a human being. For just as all in Adam die, so too Christ shall be brought to life, but each one in proper order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he subjected everything under his feet. When it says that everything has been subjected, it is clear that it excludes the one who subjected everything to him. When everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will people accomplish by having themselves baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they having themselves baptized for them? Moreover, why are we endangering ourselves all the time? Every day I face death. I swear it by the pride in you, brother, in you brothers and sisters that I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If at Ephesus I fought with beasts, so to speak, what was benefit to me? If the dead were not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be led astray. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The message about the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, <clears throat> announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, the listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, Jesus left the temple area and was going away. 
when his disciples approached him to point out the temple buildings. And he said to them in reply, You see all these things, do you not? Amen, I say to you, there shall not be left here a stone upon another stone that shall not be thrown down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us when this, will this thing happen, and what sign shall there be of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said to them in reply, See that no one deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. And they shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and reports of wars, and see that you are not alarmed. For these things must happen. But it shall not yet be the end. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and earthquakes from place to place. And all these are the beginning of the labor pains. Then they shall hand you over to persecution, and they shall kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And then Many shall be led further into sin. They shall betray and hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because of the increase of iniquity, the love of many shall grow cold. But the one who perseveres to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. This is the truth, peace be with you. Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your presence and of the consummation of this age? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So of course, being the season of the Holy Cross, one of the main themes that runs through it is the end of the world. And last night after last night's sermon, I was told it was kind of discouraging. And I simply replied and I said, well, this week is the end of the world gospel. Next week is also the gospel of the end of the world. It's hard to put a spin on it, which is encouraging when all you're talking about all hell breaking loose and chaos and the antichrist and people killing you and being persecuted. So let's shift it today. Let's not focus, when everyone thinks of the end of the world, they think about Hollywood and the movies and destruction and chaos. That is not what our Lord is primarily talking about. He says, this is what you'll know. When the world goes into convulsions, you'll know that the time is coming for my appearance. It's about transition. This is why after every time in our anaphoras, every single time we offer the divine liturgy as Syriac, in the Syriac tradition, we look towards that last day. It's something that we desire. Remember the words, Maranatha, Maran, Tha, our Lord is coming. The Protestants have picked it up. It was an, a liturgical acclamation at the beginning of the church. St. Paul uses it in his letters. Morantha, Maranatha, Lord come. Our Lord, Moran. And so in the Syriac tradition, we always look to this day as the moment of our Lord's appearance. And that's what the question is in the gospel today. 
The apostles have come out of a clash with the Pharisees. And our Lord has these denunciations, woe to you for this and woe to you for that, and you're doing this wrong, and why are you doing this? Why do you exaggerate that? That's why the gospel today begins by saying, and then they left the temple area. And clearly what the apostles are doing is trying to say, Lord, look at how beautiful it all is, trying to change the whole mood of what's just taken place with the Pharisees. And then our Lord in that same place at the temple, he simply says, you see all those buildings? I'm telling you right now, they're all gonna be ripped down. Not a stone upon a stone will be left. So it didn't change the mood that much. And apparently then what they do is they go out of Jerusalem, they go to the east down the Valley of Josephat, and then up to the other hillside, which is the Mount of Olives. And then apparently they sit down and that's when the apostles then say, after that moment, that interlude of clearly what must be silence, just kind of walk along thinking, well, this doesn't seem to be a nice afternoon. And come to the other side, and then the apostles ask the question, Lord, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your presence, parousia? And in the gospel, this is fascinating because this is the only place that word is used. One time in the gospels your presence. It's translated as your coming, but it actually means your appearance, your presence, your public manifestation. But they also link it by saying, and what will be the sign of the end of this age? So they've actually asked three things. When are the temple's buildings going to be destroyed? Remember, these buildings were all new at that point. They had just been built over the last 40 years. And everyone admired them. You know, the Jews admired them, the pagans admired them. Everyone admired this building complex. It was gorgeous. So when is it going to be destroyed? And when, what will be the signs of your appearance? And the end of time, the end of this age. So there's three things that are being answered in this gospel. So as I said last night, we tried to talk about Kronos and Kairos that we've talked about, the moments of time and the transition which we've already considered before, so you won't miss a great deal if we shift to something else. But this morning, let's consider the transition. Why does the Antiochian tradition, the Syriac tradition of Antioch, look to this day? Because this day is the appearance of our Lord in his full glory. Our Lord is, is now present to us in the divine mysteries, especially substantially in the Holy Eucharist. But he's also present in those baptized, configured metaphysically by the sacred mystery of baptism. And he's also present even more so in those who live in the state of grace and the friendship with God. So our Lord is present all around us, but we don't see him. It's not a manifest presence. It's a, man, it's a presence that we see by faith, much as in the Old Testament, those believers who waited for the coming, the manifestation of the Messiah. For us, the Messiah has already come historically, but we wait for his full manifestation in glory. And so it's a question of transition. But transitions are never easy. We know that, we move. God only knows how many times I've moved. I'm finally finishing at the end of two years. We're getting close to the last cardboard boxes and books coming out. Just in time to start packing them again, I suppose, for another place. The point is, is that transitions always have hardship because it's, there's an unknown. And so what our Lord is saying to them is, yes, the desire is to see our Lord in his full glory. But the transition will not be easy because not everyone wants this transition. So when you read in the gospel about the earthquakes and wars and devastation and destruction and persecution, it's because the world, that aspect of creation which is not in union with God and not disposed to God, goes into convulsions in refusal and in revulsion of the presence which is being made manifest. That's the understanding of the end of the world. So in transitions, they're always hard. Now notice in the middle of it, our Lord winds up saying, in you, you will be handed over to persecutions. So it just goes from being cheery to even cheerier. And all the nations of the earth are going to hate you 
for my sake, because of me. That's what he's telling me. This is your proposal. To be hated, to be hunted down, and then slaughtered. Right from the beginning of the gospel, that's in. So, you know, I mentioned it. My purpose is never to be discouraging. But I do want us all to be serious about how we follow the gospel. The church has always been serious. And so in that seriousness, our Lord is telling the apostles, because you embrace this truth, the world which doesn't want this will hate you for it, my sake, and will hunt you down, persecute you, and put you to death. We get rid of you because you're a constant reminder of something they do not want. So it's a question of transition. Today we also honor the Feast of St. Focus. Now, I'm sure many of you do not make novenas and devotion and, and to St. Focus. So who is St. Focus? Focus is one of the early priests, early bishops of the church. He is killed, he's martyred in the year 117. All right? So to put it in its context, this man was born we can estimate probably about the year 50. So to put it in a context that we can understand, this, this man was a baby relative to our Lord's ascension. As to us in 2019, we are relative historically to 9-11. And of course, many of us were alive in 9-11, right? Not all of us. But that, that distance of time, which is a stone's throw, it's nothing. That's when this man came into the world after the ascension. And somehow he received the faith. It was given to him. He, become, he lives in the northern shore of Anatolia, of Turkey, the Black Sea. And he becomes the bishop, the parish priest of Sinope, which is kind of an isthmus, a peninsula that sticks out into the Black Sea. Big trading post well-known and rich. And so he is the, the one who's bringing the divine mysteries and preaching the gospel to these people. And he winds up being arrested under Trajan, the emperor Trajan. And St. John Chrysostom, 300 years later, when his relics, his remains are brought from Sinope, brought to Constantinople, he gives the whole sermon. And he winds up speaking about the kind of vicious and fierce torturing that is done to this bishop before finally is executed. And his execution, he winds up being killed in the baths, like St. Cecilia. And we have the beautiful window of St. Cecilia and the steps going up to the choir loft. Cecilia is killed in the same way. They killed them in the baths, which doesn't make any sense to us because we don't think of our bathrooms as being threatening places. But of course, a bath in the Roman times had a furnace. You had to keep a fire going if you wanted hot water. And the wealthy could the only ones be affording this or a public bath. And so you had, you had a fire that could be stoked and you could make the room comfortable or you could make the room infernal and kill the person by suffocation or scalding, which is what they did for St. Cecilia. They killed her this way. The death by scalding or death by suffocation is the heat by killing them through um, in the bath. And so they did this also to Saint Focas. And Focas is known as one of the great, he's the mega martyr, one of the great martyrs, one of the great wonder workers in the church. And so it's nice that on this day we have the beginning steps of our beloved servers, which you have the ceremonies that we're going to do momentarily in the bulletins that they begin the first step. We're going to disentangle the ceremonies. The last baptism I did, uh, I don't know, actually almost a year, 10 months ago. If you do the whole ceremony together with some explanation, it takes an hour and 10 minutes. Because really it's a series of sermons that are a series of ceremonies that are put together one after the other. Because for a long time, we've always wanted everything streamlined, make it fast. Don't make me to come to church more than once, please. So you put all the ceremonies together and it takes forever. But what we're going to do is actually break the ceremonies down so that for many of you who've never seen the, the Maronite baptism, you'll be able to see the proper ceremonies being done 
uh, section by section, in three sections. This one today, and in November 10th will be the second section, which is much more. In fact, it will replace the beginning part of our liturgy instead of what we do now. And then in January, around the Feast of the Epiphany, the boys will actually be baptized and chrismated. So for these young men, it's also transition. They embrace the gospel that in this gospel our Lord promises that the nations of the world will hate you, that they will hunt you down, and yes, they will kill you. But they know this. They've been doing catechism for a year and almost two years now, so they're going to be our future catechists. But in this understanding of the faith, it's not because of the fact that, yes, I want to be killed. Who wants to be killed? I don't want to be killed. You don't want to be killed. But it's because we are pointed in the direction of transition towards the manifestation of our Lord in His glory. Who doesn't want to see our Lord? If you don't want to see our Lord, you're not here. So by the very fact, it begs the question that you're in the pew, you desire this transition. You desire to see the Lord God. It may be martyrdom in between, but it's only a stepping stone. Death is not permanent. Death is a transition. It's a stage and a chapter we go through. A little more dramatic, but kind of like puberty. The whole transition that we move towards this manifestation of our Lord. And so today in this ceremony is what will take place. You have them in the bulletin, but just I don't give you the rubrics, I just give you the actual prayers. It will begin at the door and there will be a prayer over them because what the church is doing is taking the individuals, these two young men, out of a world which itself is fallen and wounded by sin. And it's beginning to take them under her wing, which is why the sponsors stand next to them. So it's a removal for a world which is <clears throat> fundamentally good, but is still wounded and tainted, towards a movement of the illumination to see our Lord in his full manifestation. So the promise of faith, hope, and charity, and the promise of illumination are the initial ceremonies this morning. Now what will be done, in case you don't see, is one of the things that's done is on the forehead. You make the sign of the cross, but the cross is the tau in the Hebrew. It's the old law. And the tau looks to us like an X, not upright, like we think of the cross like this. And the reason why this is done on their foreheads is it harkens back to the vision of Yehezkel, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel has a vision of a destruction of Jerusalem. Again, where seven angels, seven men come down through the northern gate. And before that, one of the angels stops the other men and they say, you stop now. And you mark the elect, the chosen ones, with the Tau. Because all who have the mark of the Tau on their forehead in Jerusalem will not be slaughtered with the destruction of the city. So the church takes this emblem of election, of being chosen to her children, and places it upon these individuals as the beginning of the promise of moving them, of protection, selection, chosenness, and then, of course, what the angels do in the vision of Ezekiel, they come in and they destroy everything in Jerusalem. Every man, woman, and child is killed, except for those who have the mark of the Tau on their foreheads. It'll be echoed again in the book of Revelation, this marking of the elect. So that's part of the ceremony that will take place. Then, we will, bring, we, will bring them into the, we will bring them to the front here for the markings, and we will take them by the hand, and because there's three of us, we'll form a chain and come in. And that is the entrance into the church by the church bringing you and leading you in. The church is not chaotic. Everything is done by order. So she brings you from the outside. For those of you who have been to Italy, you've seen the ancient churches where you have a church building and you have a baptistry. It's a separate building because the non-baptized weren't even allowed to be in the building because the building is just a building to make sure it doesn't rain on our heads. What you're actually entering is the community which is the body of Christ. 
And if you're not baptized, you wouldn't be among those members. And therefore, in the baptismal ceremony, you're being initiated as a member of Christ. Therefore, the baptistry was even a separate building. It's why even in the 20th century, when this building was built, the baptistry sticks off the side of the front of this. It's now an elevator. But the baptistry is off properly, liturgically, historically, off of what was the vestibule. And that's why it's a different structure. If you've never noticed, notice the stained glass windows that are in the elevator shaft. It's because they're all baptismal scenes. They're all about baptism because the building was no longer a separate building, but it was attached, but it was attached at the end of the building and connected you in through the vestibule to get to the baptistry. That's the reason for it. So the church will lead them by the hand to bring them in. And then the final prayer is done, the full signing of the cross from the forehead down to the chest, the heart, the center of our being, and then from ear to ear, from the right ear to the left ear. And it signifies at that point of the church taking as belonging by promise, belonging to the Christ, belonging to the Messiah and his church. So what is done today is transition. It is about the end of the world. It's about an old world which is different for these young men. And the world that comes in front of them is seen with different eyes. You don't see the world as all the other 10th graders do in your school necessarily. Some of them. Because it begins the illumination of faith and promise. <clears throat> and so it is a promise of the protection of the church, the healing that the church avails, and of election of the chosenness of God's providence. And then finally, the promise of the full illumination, which will take place through chrismation and baptism. So when we understand all of that, we understand the question that we started with with our Lord. What will be the signs of your coming? What will be the signs of your presence, your appearance? Well, the sign of that presence which is promised is what we will witness this morning with the beginning of the steps of these young men to fully embrace the gospel of peace and of transition and of life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Spirit. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not me, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for our sin and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit, Tervot ma deb he da loho, walvot a loho dam chade taliyot, weyum suva taylo to keyula baytok vasku dam chayeko, harbo de shom.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Phocas. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true in holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. before you and ask you that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and your assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. 
We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. with your only Son and your Holy Spirit. When we had strayed from you by transgressing your law, you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By his saving passion, he restored us to our original in inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. En sabe lachmo bida kori shanta u bara hu kadesh waksaya bel talmi ta karomara sabe khol mehne khul khu hono denita fa khuru Dahlo faikun wahlov sagiye me taqse o me tihel khusoyon khabe wa khayid al qalam alamin. Khokano al khosa damsi wa men hamro o men mayo. Barahu Kadesh, Yabil Talmita Kadomar, Sabishtaw Mene, Ulukho, Khono Denita, Demohu Dilan Diyati Ki Khadato, Dahlo Faikun, Wahlov Sagiye, Mete Shedu Meti Hamba, Khusayyad khabe wa khayyad al-qalam al-amin Amin Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess 
your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death your burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us, have mercy on us in your kindness, and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Nite Mother of Hohio Cadisho, Una Hena Line, Ualo Corbono, no. descent he may make his spread the body of Christ our God Amen. and make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God Amen. may these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins the pardon of faults the honor of healing and strengthening of your holy church and the protection of her children from all sin and may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed, that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers, a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, 
the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin, Saint Phocas, and all the saints, May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. To our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have forgiven, with our helpful knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him 
and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. With your spirit. Let us bow our heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on the right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
you, Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and living by to drink and by of all people. Have mercy on us.
Oh God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of the, your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. So just a reminder of our Hafli coming up next Saturday, of course, the celebration. If you haven't gotten your tickets, well, the tickets will also be available at the door. And, of course, in between now and then, you need to blow the dust off of your dupki shoes and be ready for what will be good music and good food next Saturday, 11 to 5, in Winslow at the VFW Hall. Hopefully, we'll see you all there. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.